Hello, I'm Harry Burton, and thank you for stopping by the channel. The interview you're about to watch is with James Bruce Evans. James was born in 1927 and has been involved in acting, theatre, directing and storytelling pretty much ever since. As well as being a prolific author, in fact, he's just published Older, a new book about his life in his 10th decade, James has created many landmarks, including establishing the Hampstead Theatre in 1959 and starting the Bledford Centre for the Creative Spirit in Wales in 1974. But as well as being a very visible leader in a ostensibly establishment mode, James has also been a, a pioneer in one or two less obvious fields. In fact, all his life, James has been on a spiritual quest of one sort or another, exploring, for example, the depth psychology of Carl Jung, both through his own analysis and through being a student of the perennial philosophy. James has been practicing meditation for 50 years and also teaching it for the last few decades. Inspired by meeting the dance pioneer Martha Graham in the 1950s, James has studied ritual as a means of exploring and even healing the wounds to the soul that seem to be the burden of rational, scientific humankind. And James has taken his fascination with ritual and all things sacred back into the theatre where actors, writers and directors such as myself have been inspired and encouraged by his leadership and generosity. James is essentially a Gnostic that most unfashionable of spiritual archetypes. He's an advocate of the language of the heart. He is modern man in search of a soul, which is perhaps why, as I was setting up the cameras in his flat, he warmed himself up by reciting a few lines of a certain Danish prince. To sleep, but just to dream, I there's the rub. Though in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There we are. Did you ever play Hamlet? Yes, I did, at the Better Market Theatre, the Bare Feet. <laughs> Why in Bare Feet? I have no idea. And who directed you? Me. It was my first theatre I was running. And uh, it was very important. I remember the first production was The Seagull. I remember John Gilbert saying, aren't you nervous? And with all the arrogance of youth, I said, no, not at all. How old were you? I was uh, 28. And I took the Trigorin out on the mud flats. Do I mean Trigorin? Yes. Out of the mud flats, barefoot, to get the experience of seeing gulls and all that. Very method. Yes. Well, that was The Seagull. What about Hamlet? Oh, sorry, that was The Seagull, yes. Hamlet... I used, before the performance, I used to run round and bare feet outside the Meadow Market Theatre on the lawn. So I was full of energy to burst on stage. I learned that from Donald Wolfett when he was in Othello. And I was acting with him. He would go to the wings, to the ladders, shake himself up and then stall on stage. For the so fit scene. You, you worked with Wolfett? Yes, as, as a young actor, yes. So when you read, for example, Stanislavski, building a character yes. and so forth. How did that fit with what you'd already seen and learned about, about stage acting? Was it a revolution? <sighs> I'm not quite sure where it started. I mean, I didn't go to drama school. Uh, I went straight into rep, weekly rep, but I was steeped in Stanislavski. Um, that's why, because at the very first job in Canterbury, weekly rep, in, in Othello, I had to double Brabantia with a lot of eco. And at Brabantia, the begin of half an hour before the play began, I sit in the wings uh, with our eyes closed, pretending I'm Brabantia having a nightmare, chasing Desdemona down Ella's corridors. And then suddenly I heard Iago's voice saying, Senior Brabantia, Senior Brabantia. And I would pull on my dressing gown and hurry on stage. All be, uh, it was all bad. And the, the first night, the uh, fireman found me sitting in the wings. He, he thought I was sick. <laughs> anyway, I, I took it very seriously. You were preparing? I was preparing, much too serious, yes. Uh, so you didn't go to acting school? You, no. In fact, you, I know that you Which auditioned school? at RADA, as I did, and didn't get in. Oh, yes, that's right, yeah. And I auditioned at the Old Vic and didn't get in as well, yes. In Bristol? 
No, the Ovik in London. Was it the Ovik? Oh, um, uh, uh, George Devine. Uh, no, not George Devine, the famous French director. Michel Saint-Denis. That's right. I longed to get into that, but I did the wrong audition. <laughs> I played Sir Epica Mammon, pretending to be a fat, heavy, middle-aged man. It was the wrong choice. But you really went into acting without, without any training? Yes, that's right, yes. And who did you... Uh, Apart from reading Stanislavski, who were your heroes? Who were you emulating and trying to um, uh, trying to I think I was rise in, up to? I think my, my great influence was my first great love, David March, actor at the Playhouse, who was a, a consummate actor. I watched him in many, many performances, and I learned so much uh, from him. And then the rest was trial and error. I like things when I remember being the, the leading man at Bridgewater, and Gedith Williams was the juvenile character. He had this trick, he'd stand with his back to the audience and make faces of us, trying to make us all corpse. <laughs> and there was one play, a very moving play called, By where I was the old music teacher, and he was my beloved violinist pupil, come back to visit me. And in one crucial scene, he stood making faces at me, and I caught so badly that I had to go into the wings. And when I came back, he said, well, look at hers. <laughs> And it was, so from then onwards, I learned never to look him in the face, always to act to one side or the other. That's, that was the great thing about Weekly Rep, you learned all the time. Right. That's missing now, sadly. That's a, to then find yourself directing yourself in Hamlet, I mean, you must have been under 30. I was, yes, I was. This was very precocious, uh, if, I may, if I may say so, John. Of, of course it was. I, <laughs> I had great confidence. Um, Where do you think that came from? It is interesting because of the check of childhood, as you know, the uh, nervous breakdown at 20, analysis, all that. Um, who knows where it comes from? Yes. Now, I think it, I'm, the sins of the fathers, I wonder about that. My mother's brother, Humphrey, uh, what she said, he, he was a monk, and then he left to become an actor. I know nothing about him, but maybe something's passed down the dreams. I've known you for nearly 20 years. I had no idea you had a, an uncle called Humphrey, because that's my dad's name. Oh, I see. Oh, yes, of course, of course, that's right, yeah. That's right. <laughs> I've noticed one or two other things that you and I have in common. Um, a, an alcoholic parent. Yes. Growing up in, in very troubled, with a very troubled mother. Yes, yes. And, and directing the dumb waiter yes, at some point. Yes, yes. Um, but this, I don't want to, to dwell on it, but... Your childhood included, as far as I can see, very traumatic occasions where your mother's distress was beyond your capacity to help her. Yes, yes. And what do you think that had a, as an impact on your taste for drama, perhaps? I, all I know was that I never went to... The only theatre I went to as a, as a youngster, I think at 12, the first time I was to Peter Pan at Golders Green, and then from school, we saw Donald Wolf as a nursery like it at Cheltenham, and once to Stratford from school, see Macbeth, where the unforgettable performance was by a young, unknown actor playing Banco, Paul Schofield. I remember that so vividly. Wow. Uh, but as a small boy, for some reason, I would create a theatre under the table and move figures around. <laughs> so where did that come from? They were having me to the theatre. But if your uncle was at Humphrey, was an actor. Yes, I never knew him and I knew nothing about him. No, but sometimes these things yes, are... That's what I meant. It could, it's handed down somehow in the blood. I never met my grandfather. And my own father had no interest in cricket. But by the age of two or three, my obsession with cricket was off, off the charts. Gosh, God. Um, one just doesn't know where these things come from. No. They, well, I think it's, it's like I, say, I say in the book, Loving... We're talking about the relationship, for instance, between grandparents and grandchildren. And I know one woman in her 80s, her granddaughter is 21, loves to visit her in Sussex, and her question always is, what was it like in your day, Granny? She's searching for a sense of history, mm. which very few young people today are interested in. It's a long time ago, but do you think your Hamlet was informed by your relationship with your own mother? I don't know, I can't remember what I did with it. <laughs> the closet scene? Yes, because it could well be. Who knows, who knows? So you, you, went, you went to Oxford. Yes. And 
obviously you had a, a big awakening there as far as wanting to be involved in, in theatre and well, storytelling. Well, I, I had several awakenings. I remember lying on the floor. I went up to test my vocation as a monk for Ampleforth Abbey. And I remember lying on the floor in a state of indecision. It was I meant to be a monk, a, a writer, a teacher, an actor. I didn't know about being a theatre director. And eventually, of course, they became all those. Um, but it took time and years of analysis to put the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together and find out the kind of person I was meant to be. What, why do you think you had a breakdown so young? Oh, it was because of two mothers. And my mother was very possessive of me, as, as you know. And then when the war broke out, she went off to work in a munitions factory, left my father for a while. And I was sent to stay with a family in Gloucestershire who taught me discipline, taught me to cook, to garden, to study. I was bottom of the class. I rose to top of the class. And I began to call this woman mother, inverted commas. And all hell broke out. And there was a scene in London where the two women met and screamed at each other. And my mother said, you are never to see Mrs. Pollard again. And she honoured that for the rest of her life. She would see. So when I went into analysis, Dr. Oku said, it's not surprising, two mothers mm. <coughs> tearing one apart. And to be banished from <coughs> the good one. The one who taught me so much, mm. yes. Do you remember any... I think we've talked in the past about James Hillman's wonderful idea about acorn theory, that the, that the acorn is contained, that the child contains the acorn of the great oak and that moments of feeling called to do something are evidence of, of a daemon, Plato's daemon, um, that idea of uh, that, we, that we've got something to do on, uh, in this lifetime. I think a similar <coughs> description is actually Jung's that each of us comes into his life with the blueprint of the person we're meant to Quite. be. And sadly a lot of people are born millionaires and they end up Porpoise, they, they waste their talents. I could have a sip of water. Mm. <coughs> At any point, can you remember any sense early on of, of a feeling of being of, of calling, perhaps the monk archetype, or the uh, any sense of feeling very attracted to uh, to something? Well, I obviously was attracted when I went to Ampleforth. I fell in love with it and listened to the abbot said, "Can I join?" And he wisely said, "Go to our house of studies in Oxford." find out more what kind of people monks are and what kind of person you are. That was very, very wise advice. What age was that? Uh, 1949, 27, 30, 47, 22. So was that before? That was already in the analysis. But had you already been in the army? I'd been in the army. That's where I became a Catholic in oh. the army in Trieste. Can you say anything about the attraction to Catholicism as a, was it a new beginning for you spiritually? I always, I had a great friend in my t teens, a remarkable man, a uh, devout Catholic, uh, and I knew that one day I would become a Catholic. I was an Anglican, and it was interesting that it happened. And I remember the, after my first communion, the priest saying, one first, a contento adesso. So how do you translate the word a contento? But it was the perfect word. Um, and. For peaceful, perhaps, in inner peace. Inner peace, yes. And for uh, a good number of years, that nourished me. For instance, I remember meditating at Oxford on the, the, the Holy Family, Mary, Joseph and the Child, in order to integrate my own troubled background. Uh, I'm no longer a Catholic, but it remains a very rich part of my uh, psyche. Um, I've travelled a long way since then. <laughs> what was the army like for you? Oh, it was, it was a, it was a blessing because I had to learn to live with other people, get on with different types of men. Uh, I did get beaten up. I was after I'd done my training. Uh, they didn't send me to the um, battle camp because they were afraid that I'd throwing hand grenades. I didn't take any of it seriously, so they kept me away from that. But I went to join the Army Education Corps and had to live in Salisbury Plain in a barrack room with, I think, 20 other soldiers. And uh, there was a bookcase. 
my father put on one side of my bed and there was a curtain in this dark room I drew, so I created a little enclave for myself. Of course that riled everybody and one night I arrived back at the barrack, all the lights were off and I heard voices inside come in and they held a trial over me. Who did I think I was? Why did I think I was separate? And then finally one of them, who was a journalist, he said, what we're doing is all wrong. And I burst into tears. But they beat you? And I did get beaten up once on the, on, on the, on the ground, yes. My goodness. It was a necessary lesson. Yes. yes. Well, being yeah. brutalised is a horrible way. No, but the whole army was a very rich experience. And it, it's, um, what, what's the word, the uh, rite of passage, yes. which is lacking today for young people. What do you think of uh, some of the ideas around, at the moment, about regenerating national service? I don't have any ideas, except uh, um, if it was good for me, because I didn't have to go to battle, uh, it could be good for other young, 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 particularly the young male, very much so. I suppose wartime was a time of emergency, but where... This was after the war, of course. It was after, it was why I only did 18 months. Right. It was just called conscription. But you also did a lot of theatre in the army. Uh, in the first infantry training, I put up a notice in the barrack saying there would be play reading by candlelight at seven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> um, then at Buchanan Castle, where I had to train soldiers in the art of speech, uh, I put on productions of the theatre there. That's true, yes. yes. But they thought you were a bit special and different, or that you regarded yourself as... Above them or no, different from? No, I didn't know, but uh, I remember my commanding officer, not gay at all, but it was a great shine to me, very supportive, and he said, that I'm going to send you to Trieste for the last three months. It'll be like a holiday for you. So that, that was wonderful, <laughs> go to Italy. And I remember going to the theatre where it was the end of the war and the Olivier of Italy called Renzo Ricci was doing Hamlet. And I went to his performance the first time he'd been back into Trieste after the war and at the end of the second act he came on stage flowers were being poured down wow. flags of Italy mm. people cheering he then spoke a poem by Carducci the song of Italy by heart everybody was weeping there's still three acts to go <laughs> that's the way to do it it was wonderful yes in a huge theatre um, how did you find because you knew you were gay by the time you were 22 in the army, didn't you? Or was that not accurate? No, no, not till I went up to Oxford. Ah. And then um, David March, uh, knowing I was testing my, he was a Catholic too, testing my vacation. He, we spent a lot of time together. Uh, I didn't realise I was falling in love or that he was, but after three months, he suddenly said, I love you. And I suddenly realised I'd found the elder brother I'd always wanted. And then we moved in together. The monks were very supportive. And that became a very important influence in my life. Yeah. And the, the legal situation for homosexuals uh, at that point, you, were you acutely aware of that? No. no. I was an innocent. I mean, I was totally... I mean, I went up to Oxford, I had no idea. I didn't know what men and women did together. I didn't know what... I didn't certainly know about men and men together. Uh, it's unheard of in this day and age, of course, that kind of innocence. Mm. But I'm quite glad I, I was innocent. I don't know that it's completely uh, unknown, because I think the archetype of the innocent is still with us, and therefore there must be people who, yes, that's who true. haven't looked at yes. uh, the internet or yes, yes. you know had, had uh, experiences too soon. But it's difficult if you're at school or your, your fellow pupils. Of course, are, yeah. yes. sure. Um, so I want to just, just fold into this part of the conversation, your beginnings with Jungian thought and Jungian uh, ways of thinking about seeing things and, and so forth, that that started, you, you, you met a, an analyst who had been taught by Jung, didn't you? No, what, what happened was, I, uh, I think I was 20, I was passing a Catholic church in Ogle Street, never been there before, I thought I'll go in for confession. I don't know what I said, but the priest said, who, I never saw him, he said, I suggest you go and see a certain Dr. Elkish in Gloucester Crescent. Oh my goodness. And that was the beginning of my uh, Jungian analysis. And then when I went to New York in 1955, I had a year with another Jungian, also trained by Jung, Masha Rollins, who never charged me. And she said, I make my rich patients pay for you. 
and then with a twinkle she shouldn't have said she said besides you're much more interesting <laughs> <laughs> she was very good she got me to keep a journal she said you're a lonely person oh. and keeping a journal is like talking to an intimate friend oh. I'm very grateful for that advice the, the Jungian and years of Jungian analysis very important until one day I came with Dr. Elkish after many years I had a certain dream and he said your analysis is at an end and from that moment on we met his friends Franz and Jimmy and he would sometimes share his dreams with me and then just the end of his life he wrote me a note saying may I be allowed to say you have cared for me as I have cared for you may I be allowed to call you son so he was the father I never had Goodness. but I didn't discover it for that moment that's very beautiful. It was. What a surrounding. Yes. Because to grow up without a present father is a, is a form of... It's a deprivation. It of course it is. Of course it is. And then it sets up the need for the rite of passage of finding a second yes, father. Exactly. Exactly. Which is a great quest, in a way, to, mm. to be on. Did you feel you were questing by the time you were... You know, out of Oxford, did you know you were on a, on a quest of some kind? I think subliminally, yes. Not, not self-consciously, but subliminally. I was, I've always been searching. Uh, I still am. And when did it become conscious, do you think, roughly? Well, it must have been under analysis. That makes you very conscious. You're observing your dreams, you're painting pictures, all that. And there's a wonderful um, collage I made uh, I'd just come out of the army, I think, gone up to Oxford. Uh, it's of a, a naked youth kneeling in front of a great face of a black Buddha in the ocean. And there's a long passage I've written about I, Pericles, have emerged from the depths of the sea and kneel before you, blah, blah, blah. But it sets out my, my map of my life, actually. It's very interesting. That was the great thing about Elkish. He got one to paint, to draw. Uh, not, not all analysts do that, of course. No. But it's a creative yes. imagination yes. Uh, process. Yes. Very enlightened. And he'd been trained by you. He'd been trained by you. And then at the outbreak of war, he, his wife was also an analyst. They had two daughters. He came to England with one daughter, not speaking any English. And Paula went to New York with the other daughter. I met her years later. Obviously a very gifted analyst as well. Yeah. What a journey. <laughs> what took you to New York in 1955 ah. to meet Martha Graham? Well, uh, uh, in 1954, the Martha Graham dance company came to London the very first time. I knew in advance about it, so I booked for the first night. And I was so bowled over, I booked for every performance that season. I wrote two long letters to her. I was summoned twice to her presence. Uh, a, a long talk with her the dressing room, and then the last night and then her manager said you come into our lives it's very important you must keep in touch and I just knew I, what Martha was talking about was no wonder Jungian analysts were making notes during her performances because she was I realized that theatre could be sacred theatre about profound deep issues and uh, so I thought I have to go to America to learn more about what modern dance is and though I was at the meta market directing and they offered me a second year, I turned it down and I got a letter, I wrote to various universities and finally the Juilliard School of Music in New York, the head of the dance faculty, said we're looking for someone to integrate music, dance and drama, will you come? I had to fly to Amsterdam to be interviewed and then I went to New York and, that, and I called it Theatre of the Imagination and it was a wonderful director's opportunity to experiment and explore about creating rituals as it all began. Um, so that was a very, very crucial year, and I was asked to stay on. I remember Pearl Lang, one of Martha Graham's leading dancers, said, we need you more for dancers than actors, but I knew I had to come back to England to plow back what I learned into the theatre here. So back I came. A very rich year. Yes. Was seeing Martha Graham's company and going back and back and watching again, that was your first sense obviously you knew about ritual from church and so forth but that was the first time that you woke up to the idea that, that ritual as a as a form had a place in 
storytelling and theatre. Yes, yes. I mean, the one I always say, the work of hers called Errand into the Maze, which was a two-hander. Uh, she, took, she took the Biff, obviously, Theseus and the Minotaur, but in this work she enters, her, Graham herself, entering the maze and finally encounters the Minotaur, a male dancer with the mask. And so terrified, she can't bear to face it, and then slowly turns, confronts it, mounts it and rides it out of the labyrinth. It's the most profound Jungian uh, analogy that, in other words, learning to ride your shadow, to tame it, to control it. Um, Integrated. Yes, so all her works were like that. Incredible depth. Extraordinary. You use the word shadow. Can you say just very briefly what that means to you? Well, it, uh, as an archetype? Uh, it means, uh, the, uh, for instance, if, if somebody says, I, I hate so and so, she's so sluttish, that's often because one is sluttish oneself, <laughs> one is projecting onto the other person. So, in the process of analysis, you have to learn about your own shadow side. Uh, it's like Sir Francis embracing the leper, as the modern image of embracing one's shadow. Or again, Sir Francis taming the wolf of Gubbio, it's an even another perfect image. These wild emotions inside one, one has to come to terms with them and know how to handle them. Why? To become an integrated person, otherwise you can be destroyed by them. Uh, they, can, they can lead you to impulsive behaviour, uh, it can lead you to murder, all sorts of things because you're no longer in control of yourself. I heard James Hillman give a lecture once where he suggested that Shakespeare was so full of murderers and poisoners and uh, disembowelers that because it, he, he felt he was in danger of doing those things himself in life and by putting them on the stage didn't need to act them out. That's very interesting. And where did it all come from for Shakespeare? It's amazing. Well, we know where some of it came from. A lot of it came from mythology. Well, no, but no, the, 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 it's the same with all great art. I think, I think it was Hillman who said um, three different kinds of knowledge. There's uh, scientific knowledge where you weigh one fact against another. There's um, uh, philosophic, philosophic knowledge where you weigh one, one uh, idea against another. And then what he calls contemplative knowledge, but I prefer the word intuition. Because where does it come from, this gift of Bach, Mozart, Shakespeare, whatever? Mm. And in Jungian thought, intuition is a close cousin of Sophia, of wisdom. Yes, yes, yes. Which I understand in Jungian terms, it, it, Sophia is the female counterpart of God. Yes, of course, of course, yes. So I often wonder, you know, about this time that we're in, which is so technological and so scientific-minded and rational, and what's been left out uh, in the last three, four hundred years not least the, the kinds of rites of passage for young men that you were talking about mm -hmm. just now, but so many other things. And that, uh, you know, Jung talked about the return of the feminine. Yes. Do you see that happening in the world? We're seeing an uprising of, of feminist politics and, and empowered women. Is that part of, a, of, a, of what Jung meant by the return of the feminine? Well, it's only a part, because Sophia goes much deeper. She was with God at the big, big creating of the world. Uh, she's the depth of wisdom. Uh, I remember a, a remarkable nun at Stanbrook Abbey saying if women are to be ordained priests, they should be called priestesses because it's a very different role, a woman as a priest, to a male as a priest. And also, actually Pope John Paul I, who's only Pope for a few weeks, once in St. Peter's Square, at one of his talks, he said, we have to learn to address God as our mother, to say our mother who art in heaven. Because if God is infinitely all things, God must be both male and female. The trouble is that the three-letter word God is such a stumbling block nowadays. And it's because of this centuries of um, patriarchal approach that God is an old man with a long beard, uh, with a young son to help him decide the bird flutter. It's all anthropomorphic. Whereas Meister Eckhart, as you know, said God is no thing. For me, God is an energy, a force, uh, a, a, a an ocean of love, if you like, but the whole universe is surrounded by this intelligence. Um, it's not a person, that's a great mistake. Mm. So, you, by seeing Martha Graham and those dancers, you, you really were excited by the idea of... It was a revelation, yes, it was, yes. How did the Hampstead Theatre Club happen? Typical of me, 
leaping, uh, oh, there's, well, there's a wonderful phrase, leap and the net will appear, although it doesn't always appear. But I was having coffee, I'd just been directing at the Belgrade Theatre of Coventry, I was having coffee with a colleague in Hampstead, and he said, why don't you just start a theatre here? And I said, but where? He said, the mall and hall next to the Everyman Cinema, belongs to the church. So the next morning I went to see the, the rec vicar, booked it for a series of dates, a whole year, went straight down to the offices of the Ham and the High, the following week there were headlines on the front page, Hampstead to have neighbourhood playhouse. It all happened as quickly as that. Then I had people in the high street, actors, passing out leaflets and all that. And so we, and the first seven years we had no grants at all, there was no arts council, there was no fringe theatre then. And so we lurched from one financial crisis to another. Uh, but it was a, a, a it wouldn't, why we got all the, the new plays coming just because there was no other French theatre to try out new plays, so Michael Codron and everybody else were queuing up for us, do our plays for us. Uh, it was an exciting time. An, an amazing undertaking. Did you, you, but you never had any thoughts about, am I the right stuff? Can yeah. I be a leader? You just knew. But, but, I said, leap. Yes, I, I've done that all my life. Um, otherwise, if you start uh, prevaricating and becoming over-introspective, you kill the, the initiative. The thing is to jump and le learn as you go. I'd love to ask you about meeting Harold Pinter. Yes. Because um, I uh, know that our, our friends at Leeds with their Pinter Legacy oh, project yes, yes. are very interested to hear stories, um, you know, uh, about people's experience. You directed the premiere production of The Dumb Waiter in London. In London, that's right. What happened was that um, Walter Hart, an actor who was director of the Central School, he said, I think you ought to look at this play, it was The Dumb Waiter. And so I, I said, oh, we'll do it in the first season in the Mall the Hall. And I met with Howard he, in a pub. And I remember sitting across the table from him, and it's typical just of taking off his glasses, leaning towards me very intensely, and saying, what would happen if you and I were locked in a room for a long time? <laughs> he said, that's what the play is about. That's true. Um, <laughs> and uh, then he directed The, the Room, we did the double bill, got rave reviews, went to the Royal Court. And years later, he had a big party at the house, people on every floor. And I said to Vivian, what is this for? She said, it's how else we are thanking the people who helped him mm. in his career. Mm. Um, but I was never a close friend. I mean, he was always very friendly if I bumped into him. Um, so that's, my, that's all I have to say. Did, did Except there's a lovely thing. Uh, in the final... We had, we could only we had to dress rehearse on a Friday night, perform on Saturdays and Sundays, and the caretaker of the school hall, grudging, very unsophisticated chap, he stood at the back of the hall watching the run through of the dumb waiter, and he said, "Hey, the reason why the, that one chap kills the other is because he talks too much, isn't it? Perfect, because the, the intellectuals went it open. They all argued. What was this about? And that's what it was about. I told how I was delighted with that. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. There was a critic who, who um, when my, my production opened in the West End, uh, pontificated, but who is Wilson? They talk of Wilson. Is Wilson God? And Harold was furious. He said, no, he's Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> but was the, was the room, was it a double bill? At the, at a double bill, there? yes, yes. And when you read these plays, did you, did you get them or did you, did you oh, need I, a little I, bit of deciphering? No, I was excited straight away, yes. How could one not be? Well, some people, of course, no, that's true. Don't, don't, don't get it and don't... No, don't and the critics certainly didn't, except for Harold. Uh, the birthday party just off in a week. Why do you think critics are, are, are sometimes so incredibly... Uh, slow to see something really new and uh, uh, and exciting. Is it because they 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 see too much theatre and therefore they're addicted to what they know? That's, I mean that's possible. I wouldn't know, but I would I would hate to be a critic night after night after night. Yes, and you do have to sit through some drops anyway. But the room is a, is a mystifying play. It is, and very very funny for that reason. Mm. It's was Henry Wolfe in your in your? Oh yes, he was. Yes, same as the kid. Yes, he was, and Vivian as well. Yes, it was a very exciting time. And George Levy made a great mistake when they transferred to the Royal Court. He put the dumb waiter on first, whereas coming second after the room, he got much more laughs. Yes, 
Yes, when I did the readings at the, for the Royal Court's 50th of those two mm. plays, we did it the right way around. Yes, yes. And there was quite a good payoff. Yes. So, Hampstead must have consumed your energies and time. Well, I worked all hours on ten pounds a week. Uh, actors got nothing in rehearsal, but ten pounds a week where they're playing. And they've never forgotten, it wouldn't happen now, Edward de Souza were rehearsing Private Lives. And the phone went during rehearsal, it was his agent, Philip Pierman. He came back very quietly into rehearsal, went on. We opened, we were a huge success, we transferred to the West End. It was only many months later I learned what happened. The Philip Pierman rang, uh, Edward had been offered a big film part, a lot of money, and he already had three children to support. He said, I can't, I've given my word to Hampstead. It's incredible, I don't think any actor would do that now. I think they would if they felt that loyalty to someone like you who... Who knows, who knows. But... Um, Not many though, it's a rare thing. But it, it was... Uh, it was a demanding time, an exhausting time, but a very rich time, indeed, yes. So it was founding Bledford, which is a centre for creative... Spirit, yes. Spirit. Was that in a way a reaction to overwork and stress and no. needing time out? Oh, no, no. Again, it's a leap of the net will fall. The, uh, I, I lived in the old rectory, and I thought, well, I'd better go to the church services. There were four every Sunday. And then the, the rector came to me and said, the church is on the provisional list for closure, what can we do? And I thought about it, and Harlan and I talked about it for about nine months. And I finally said to the rector, if, if we turn it into a centre for spiritual art, uh, as well as a continuing place for worship. So the diocese gave permission. Uh, I got a leading church architect, George Best, to reorder the church space. And then I launched an appeal, uh, and over the years I wrote thousands of letters, raised many, many thousands of pounds. And then the, the uh, school became vacant, I raised the money for that. Then some barns and fields, I raised the money for that. So now there's a wonderful barn centre, uh, the old school gallery, office, uh, tea rooms, and a cottage. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite a little empire now. And it's flourishing. And how does it sustain itself with membership and? Uh, yes, at the moment, uh, we one of my friends left uh, half her estate to the Leather Trust, and that was put into a portfolio. So there was income from that, and somebody else left us a lot of money. Uh, but we now have a very brilliant fundraiser who is going to raise further funds. So it should now be completely uh, self-supporting. And can anyone go? Yes. I mean, they've just finished the 25th anniversary of the very successful storytelling workshop, a two-week workshop. And then at the moment now, there's the Shambhala two-week meditation workshop, which is packed out every year. Um, some things do better than others, obviously, always. Uh, and where is it? Is it in beautiful countryside? It's in Radlershire, sort of near Prestine, Ludlow. It's Prestine because the festival is quite convenient. And it's about uh, encouraging people to find their own creativity. I mean, putting it very basically, it's so much nicer if somebody brings you a jar of homemade chutney or jam, uh, a loaf they made, a proposal of flowers, rather than expensive gift from a boutique. Um, and the more people can use their own creativity, the richer their lives are. Uh, that's what it's all about. And do you believe that all human beings are, are made to be creative, that the potential is there in everyone? Yes, I've seen, well certainly I've seen some surprises. Some people surprise me what they've uncovered to themselves. Yes, I think we're all capable of a great deal more. In fact, with the, I, I quote actually as we know in passage of so, the elderly woman I wrote to uh, who felt her life was wasted. And I said, buy to Charles book of paints and paint whatever comes up. I'd better find the passage, because it's so vivid mm. and demonstrates this. A woman once wrote to me, having heard me speak on television, she was 62 and referred to the fact that she had only six months left to live. Quote, I need spiritual and mental help, she wrote. Till I heard you, I was resigned to sitting it out to the end. Now, early letters were full of anger towards God, the church, the world. 
In the course of our correspondence, she revealed that at the age of 18, she studied art, but had then developed a mental block against it, being afraid to allow herself to be spontaneous, because, as she expressed it, spontaneity is lovely, but there is a risk. And so rather than take this risk, she repressed her rich creativity, denied her true self, and, to quote, flung myself into secretarial work, changed jobs frequently, and ended up with only a state pension. I am left with the ability to feel beauty in all its forms, but no ability now to pick up pencil or brush. Too diminished and mentally exhausted to do, I am left with a sense of having wasted my life. I wrote back, I was going to do something, to go out and buy a child's box of paints, and to sit down each day and paint, exactly like a child, whatever she was feeling. About two weeks later, there arrived a simple, almost primitive painting of a bowl of flowers exploding with colour. The shape was repeated underneath by a double shadow of the bowl, shaped like two large church bells with clappers. The dynamic colour of the flowers and the joyous swing of the bells expressed a powerful sense of energy and release, and with the picture came a letter, You have reached me, reached me, the real me, the soft, vulnerable me, the one that wants to climb out and flow and to be a kind and lovable person instead of tautened up, spitting aggression. I was so happy. Since then, and obviously long past the six months, the paintings and the letters continued. As the, it's to do with developing people's creativity. It's linked to spirituality, becoming a whole person. <clears throat> Rather a long quote, I'm sorry about that. No, no, absolutely, um, absolutely lovely. And, and it, it reminded me, uh, I think I was, I've told you this before, when I first started directing, I ran some workshops very much based on your book, That's on your right, exercises, yes. mm. and a woman of 55 who had been a singer and she hadn't sung for 30 years. She'd just given her life up to her children to, and she'd, she'd just moved on. And I had a letter that came two, three months later. I'm singing, and and I I am back in my soul, you know, Wonderful. back in myself. Wonderful, unforgettable. Yes. But that was your doing. Yeah. Where did you when you began, when you began putting this book? This is how I met you was yes, through this yes, book, which I think I found in a secondhand bookstop shop, <laughs> uh, shop, and I thought um, I want to meet the man who who wrote this. How did you create the the extraordinary exercises and ideas of of uh, deep, soulful pro rehearsal and process. It's, it's interesting. Where did it, I mean, first of the journey to the frontier was a very powerful exercise. <coughs> like, I'll give one example of it, and I'll try and answer your question. Uh, at a week-long ritual workshop in Wales, one friend, an actress friend of mine, uh, the exercise is that it's a variation of the journey to the frontier. There's the end of a studio, there's the line marking the frontier, and people normally set out to journey towards the frontier. It's different for everyone, do they cross it or not? But there's a version I do where people out of newspaper create a boat and they put a night light, and then they have to sail their boat to the frontier. And this all takes a long time. And on this occasion, everybody crossed over except for this one person who sat at the frontier with her circular boat, with the cat and the light in the middle. And when everybody had gone, she came towards me and said, will you blow it out? I can't. And I did. And later in the day, I discovered what it was. She had that day learned that she could no longer have a child. So it was a very powerful uh, uh, exercise for her. Um, but where these ideas came from, sometimes dancing, I, I used to dance a lot to music on the radio. And once I was listening to Goreski's third symphony and I began to dance it, move it and I realised it was about to journey to the mother so I then did a whole series of workshops about journey to the mother which were incredibly powerful particularly for the women who came um, yes, where does it all come from? I don't know well, for people who don't know about these exercises, they very often involve thresholds and the crossing of thresholds. Yes, yes. They are, in effect, rites of passage. Yes, they are. They in, are. A, in a very, I would s describe it as a very safe container. 
Yes. Uh, a place where people can be supremely vulnerable yes. Yes. and forget time, mm. in fact drop into what the Greeks would call kairos yes. as opposed to chronos, eternal time, po poetic time, dream time, mm. and experience through their own volition and choices how and when and whether to cross these these thresholds, yes. which they have attached meaning to by slowly um, discovering something they want to work on or an issue or a, a, a relationship or something that is significant for them emotionally. I think also it's, uh, it is a question of taking time. For instance, I recently quoted, uh, I've done many workshops with the washing of the feet and as one woman wrote an extraordinary letter saying how powerful it was, uh, the experience uh, again, I, 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 oh yes, I, I was preaching thing. Um, Jesus, it's very interesting, the churches, that Jesus did two things at the last meal, uh, bread, bless the bread and wine, so this is my body, but, but he also washed everybody's feet, so it was all do the same. And it, it doesn't happen anymore, or if it does, it's just perfunctory. But if you really spend an hour um, bathing and washing somebody's feet, <clears throat> you learn so much about them, Selves and about your partners if you're washing your partners feet. It's having time, space is very important. Time out. We live in such a rushed society. Hmm. Um, we have we barely touched on the word, but it's a word I bring into my work with students and so forth because they haven't really heard it applied to performance and so forth. But the soul, the psyche, the soul. What, what are your feelings about the soul and, and it, our relationship to it and, and these exercises in terms of activating it? And I know, it's a biggie, but it's so important. I think the, the whole journey in life is about discovering every aspect of oneself and integrating it, weaving it together so it's an inner uh, experience, an inner journey, which then is reflected in one's outward activities. Um, it's, it's what Jung referred to as modern man in search of a meaning. Uh, what it, a lot of people have no meaning in their lives at all, and the meaning is profound inside oneself. Mm. Um, and churches nowadays, it, it don't meet the needs of people, uh, too many words, it's all rather antiquated, uh, and yet people are hungry for things of the spirit very much so. It's interesting, our meditation group, which has been going now about 12 years, it's a very interesting mix. Disc jockey, uh, actors, uh, Alexander teacher, analysts, etc. Uh, and only, I think, three of them are Christians. But it's a great sharing of the depths of silence. And now, I used to give the talk every time once a month, but now the group is so mature, they take it in turns. Dan the disc jock is doing the talk ne the next two weeks time, uh, and then an actor's doing it after that, and now I'll do a talk. Um, and so what we're lacking actually is a sense of community. I think this, there was a report in the Times about recently, one knows that over 50% of older people are lonely, and many have television for company, but the, a recent report in the Times shows that Young people between the ages of 24 and 35 are also suffering from loneliness. And I think it's because we no longer have street communities, house communities, even in the house in which one lives with flats, rarely do people come together and work together. Um, so we've lost all that. So each of us is, is alone and lonely. So I think small groups, whether it's a book group, meditation group, uh, there are various such groups. I think they're all important. They create a sense of, of family, of friendships. Mm. That's beautiful. I wanted, to, at this point, I thought maybe I should remind you of the quote from Peter Brook that you put in the book. A great ritual, a fundamental myth is a door. And he who can experience, she who can experience the door within himself, herself, passes through it most intensely. And I think that's, that's what your book, Passages of the Soul, yes. taught me, was that intensity is something that people crave and long for but don't necessarily know how to name no. and that if you can create a meaningful ritual 
that is safe and boundaried, people can connect to something in their depths that, that's been abandoned and yes, forgotten, yes. and it's a complete renewal. Yes, it is, it is. There's very little of it going around. Uh, but I don't believe that the, the light ever quite goes out on it. No. And maybe when things get really dark, like they are a bit at the moment with Mr. Trump yeah, and, right. um, and Mr. Johnson, mm -hmm. maybe that's when this sort of hearing you, that was my impulse for wanting to talk to you really like this, not, not least because I, you know, I love our friendship, but you know, you've been doing this for so long and, and with such passion and commitment and helped so many people, I'm sure. And just because things have gone a bit dark out there doesn't mean you've stopped. You've, you've kept going and other people have kept going. I think as uh, the book older, uh, I, say, I do say, um, well you saw it in the press release, that um, it's, a, it's a constant process of, of unlearning and letting go of things in order to learn new things. It's a continuing journey right to the end. It's so sad, many men, for instance, when they retire, one sees they, they have the slump in front of the television, but now they the betting shop as I see them. Or if they're wealthy, they play golf every day. They're wasting rich years. Tell me a bit more about the title is? Uh, older. Uh, because people sometimes say to me, I'm old. And I say, no, uh, you're older. The, different, the word old with a D at the end sounds like a door slamming, finish. Whereas older, it's as Elliot says, old men should be explorers still. One should go on exploring and discovering. And I find that very exciting in my 10th decade, amazingly. <laughs> so how did Older come about? Oh, my publisher friend, uh, Tony Morris, who's chairman of the Bledford Centre, it was his idea and the title. Now, at one point when I was working on it, he said, I wonder if you shouldn't change the title to Growing Older. And I said, no, that sounds horticultural. <laughs> uh, no, Older is much better. It was his idea, so the book's dedicated to him. And what form does, does the book take? Oh, it's a, it's a diary, a journal, day by day. So it's full of, it's full of, it's, it's a rich, uh, lucky dip. It's full of different things, yes. A, a daily diary? Almost. One or two days. Originally, I would sometimes say, uh, I, don't, I missed this day, but I've left those out. I've left a few, about six days out, otherwise it's daily, yes, yes. What surprised you about the writing of this new book? I learned a lot. It's again another journey of discovery. It's extraordinary. Life is so rich. Do you meet Do you meet yourself and and find that you like yourself in your in the book? Yes, I'm very truthful. Uh, I think you have to. Well, I think. What's the point of years of analysis unless you can be truthful about yourself? <laughs> well, analysts will tell you that half their clients aren't interested in being truthful <laughs> with themselves. Um, no, I uh, know myself pretty well. And I say things like, for instance, I've meditated all these years, yet because of old age, I often drop things. I say, fuck! <laughs> and then I realise it's just a wonderful explosion of energy and it lets go. Mm. So I don't worry about that. <laughs> I'm not alert, I've gathered from other people my age, they drop things, one's hands aren't quite so in control. And when will the book be published? September the 30th, at Dort's again. In, uh, in, in Marlborough? In High Street, yes. Wonderful. Yes. And will there, will there be electronic editions of this book? I don't know. The Zuleika Books is a new publishing company which is quite dynamic, and very successful. Uh, they're full of bright ideas, so who knows? What do you mean by, oh, you mean a Kindle? Mm. Yes, I'm sure if Tom thinks the, the chap has found it, uh, I leave that all to him. Uh, he's doing a, a paperback, and then next year there'll be a, is it called a trade edition, a cheap, slightly cheaper edition? So anyway, he's got it all planned. When did you learn to meditate, how did that happen? At the time in the 60s, the school of meditation was, you know, the Maharishi, all that. So I started, I, I, I went, was inducted as it were, and then I would have to go every month. And I found that different instructors each time get to give one different advice. So then I started practicing entirely on my own. Uh, 
and I've been practicing on my own ever since, over more than 50 years. Um, I think one of the problems in our society is a fear, a lack of silence. Many couples get up and they switch on the radio or television or whatever all day long. Uh, and even in the Times recently, there was a two-page article that many people having sex are still conduct, looking at their iPods and all their endless distractions. Um, and what meditation does, the practice, uh, is to contact the, this, A, to learn to be with silence, to be silent, and then to find the inner silence within oneself, which is very powerful, very rich. But it does call for discipline, because there can be days, weeks even, when it's a struggle, because endless busy thoughts, like blue bottles buzzing around all the time, but you persevere with centering down into this inner silence. And there are different ways of doing it. You can have uh, do the Buddhist meditation of breathing in, pause, breathing out on one, up to a count of eight. And then if you lose count, go back to the beginning again. That's a very good one. Or some people find a mantra, which is a word or a phrase. Um, one of our group, for instance, when her husband got Parkinson's, which she had for 12 years before he died, she took as her mantra the words, that I may be filled with loving kindness, because she knew that she would be very sorely tested. Um, and the slow results, the, uh, the harvest of meditating, is you aren't swept high by praise or plunged low by criticism. You learn to keep an even balance. You learn not to lose your temper. You learn to be patient with people, however boring they may be. Um, you're a healthier human being as a result. So it's nothing religious about it, it's just a, a natural practice that we can do. This is where the Buddha, we owe it to the Buddha basically, don't we? This practice of meditation. The way you said that makes me think of the Jungian idea of being in the tension of opposites. Yes. And, and that that is the, the most opportune way to create new consciousness yes. rather than to be banged back and forth between extremes to open up a space where you coexist with the extremes yes. but don't go there and that that is the, the best way to, to have new to create new consciousness yes because often in, when you're meditating what happens is resentments come to the surface lusts come to the surface worries come to the surface and you learn to acknowledge them say yes I recognize you and then let them go um, and they do eventually uh, recede. Um, Is there a, di a difference in the quality of inner peace from using a mantra and being silent? I don't know the answer to that one. Um, Which do you prefer? I think, for instance, our group is not based on any particular form of meditation. Some have a mantra, some count up to eight. Some just do what Quakers do, centering down, listening to the inner side. Some of the most powerful Quaker meetings I've been to is at 60 minutes of total silence, dynamic. Um, there was one meeting I went to in Providence, Rhode Island on Easter Sunday, Quaker meeting. I was the only person who got up to speak. And all I said was, there's something dead about this meeting. And afterwards they said, how did you know? How did you know? Will you come back next Sunday? Come I thought only Quakers could respond like that. Uh, so there are dead silences and there are living silences, which are so powerful. Oh. I think this is what Pentecost is about, especially if the tongues of fire descended. Uh, suddenly it's pulsating. It's cleansing. It was a good 60 minutes at a Quaker meeting of total silence. It's wonderfully cleansing. Do you think of yourself as a Quaker? No, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from the Quakers and I've enjoyed attending meetings. But I don't feel the need to go to church or anywhere anymore. I've moved, moved on. Judy Dench is a Quaker, isn't she? She is, that's right, yes. Didn't you teach her at the Central School? Yes, I did. Uh, oh gosh, yes, you're quite right. I have Vanessa Redgrave. Yes, that's right. And it's, we, we, I've lost touch with her, but uh, she's lovely. And Michael Williams. I was a student of mine at RADA, yes. 
Gosh. And was Judy clearly a very special actor at that point? Yes, her, her, it's an inner quality that shines out of her. Do you think actors can learn to bring that inner quality to the fore, or is it fundamentally a, a, a gift from God? I think it's a gift, yes. It's like, um, I remember Patrick Garland telling me a story. He directed Ingrid Bergman at a play at the West End, and a colleague of his went to see him. He said, it's so clever, Patrick, what you've done, that she has this follow spot. Patrick said, there's no follow spot. It's her own inner quality. <laughs> That's wonderful. And Richard Burton had the same thing. You couldn't take your eyes off him. And Paul Schofield, of course, too. So a kind of charisma. It is. It is. It's a gift. I think Rylance has it too. Yes, yes. Yes. But it's quite rare. Very rare. Very rare. So how long have you been meditating now? Uh, 84, 94, 94. It was said about 50 years. More, yes. And you do it pretty much daily? A daily, yes. A half hour of the day each day, uh, and sometimes it's sometimes in the evening if I feel like it. Do you nod off? No, 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 only at night. <laughs> no. So would you recommend meditation as a, as a beginning practice for somebody who wants to begin having a, for want of a better phrase, a, a spiritual experience? And what is a spiritual experience as opposed to a religious one? Oh, well, religion is primarily to do with creeds and external forms, in particular whether you are uh, following Allah or Buddha. Well, no, Buddha is not a religion, Buddha is not a religion. But no, spirituality, I think it's what more people are in search of today, is a spiritual content to life rather than a religious content. Um, I think if somebody's going to start meditating, they actually need to join the group. We have one member of our group better be careful here. Uh, what just say one member of our group, I won't say who it is, um, who has been going through a great crisis. And then something, or I lent him a book called, called The Buddha, Jeff and I. And it had a powerful effect on him. He started going to, he's a Christian, goes to the Hampton Parish Church, but he started going to the Eccleston Square, the Buddhist centre. And since then, been on a week-long Buddhist meditation course. I think you need to practice just on your own without it, but you could get lost. So I think you need to relate to some group to learn, and then you work on your own. Um, it's a thing of mutual support. What's wonderful about our group is a very hamster. We all have Prosecco afterwards, those who drink or water. Uh, but they've, they've formed different groups of conversation. Friendships have sprung up over the years. Very strong friendships. You yourself have been ordained uh, as a... Anglican priest, not stipendiary, unpaid. But priest, is that the right word? Priest, or or yes, minister? Priest, priest, yes, yes. But it, would it be fair to say that meditation has been the most consistent practice of your spiritual life? Yes, yes, yes. But you also pray, I know you do. I've come up, I was telling, we had the, the last meeting of our group we were in the garden and uh, I was talking about prayer because Jesus says, ask and it, knock and it shall be opened, ask and it shall be given, seek and you will find. I said, certainly true if you seek you will find, but you can often knock and, and just bruise your knuckles and you can ask. And I said, that doesn't make sense because Farmers can be praying for rain, at the same time married couples are about to be married praying for fine weather for their wedding and honeymoon. And so I don't believe in, in asking for anything. Um, what I do now as a, a practice, and I write about it, I think, oh yes, in, in older, is if somebody's in trouble, about to have an operation, going through a difficult relationship, whatever, I tell them that I will sit in silence for them for an hour. Or it was inspired by thinking, of Jesus saying, can you not watch for only one hour? And so I will sit in silence for an hour, totally focused on that person. And I think it's related to the, the gift of, te of telepathy, that we could transmit energy. I think that's how this absolute healing works. And also on a very simple level, which I was telling them, we could be in the middle of doing anything, and suddenly somebody's name comes to the surface we haven't thought about for ages. 
And I think a phone rings, it's that person that I wanted to talk to on. Uh, so t uh, telepathy, I think, is really important for the prayer for me. I is that the front door as well? Or just is that the way the phone rings? That's the phone ring. <laughs> Something that you and I have more than once talked about. Synchronicity, the idea of meaningful mm. coincidence. Yes, yes, yes. Tell me one story from your life about uh, a strange and unaccountable... Well, when I was 31, I'd never been to a gay pub. I was very lonely, so I went to the William IV on one evening. Unknown to me, Harold Jones, who's become my partner for 50 years, he was nine years younger, just out of the army, a country boy, never been to a gay pub. If we hadn't met that evening, it seemed planned. Uh, and how I used to say it was, it was meant. Um, so I think, and all the key, like the, going to that priest for confession, to say, go and see a Dr. Elkish and work, otherwise I wouldn't have known anything about Jung analysis. I think that there is, a, 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 I have no doubt, that there's a pattern and a purpose to every life. Uh, and if we learn to listen, we will see which path to go, which path not to go. I mean, sometimes in life, somebody appears to stop from going down the wrong path, which is very valuable. I'm very grateful to people who have criticised me always and held up a mirror to me. That's very important. I remember when I was younger, uh, the director of Methuen's, whom I knew through Eleanor Farge, he said, you must stop name dropping. And it was very valuable because I was so insecure, sure. I had met a lot of famous people through Ellen and others, but I realised why I was doing it, it was to boost my own ego. So that was a valuable bit of advice. Mm. Um, so thank God for friends who are not afraid to speak the truth. And having now younger friends is very valuable because they tease one, challenge one, all that. You can't be pompous. <laughs> How's been dead now? How long? Uh, eight, nine years. And how have you coped without your beloved? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I th I didn't weep at all uh, when he died because we'd been, so, been so blessed. There was no cause to weep. I knew that all was well. The only time I wept was a, a nun lent me a, a DVD of the mother's writer, John Donahue. And at one point he says, when we see somebody dying, that's what we see. But to those waiting on the other side, they're seeing somebody being born. And I shed tears of joy. Um, what was your question again? How you have coped without your yes. beloved. Then, obviously working on many drafts of the book was, was, was very helpful. Uh, but then, interestingly, which is in older, I started, instead of going to bed at 10, I started going to bed at 9, then at 8. And Kevin, who shares the flat with me, said, what's going on? And I said, I think it's mainly only now the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being hit by the loss of Hal's physical presence in that we could be in the same room of an evening he would be reading, I would be writing occasionally we'd look up and smile didn't have to say anything that was part of it but ten nights later this is where the unconscious is so extraordinary I woke up in the middle of the night with the phrase existential loneliness I didn't know what it meant so I got up and googled it it said lack of a role I thought that's it, bang not just Hal I no longer direct, I no longer teach, I no longer perform, I do write, of course, but I'm a yesterday's man in that sense. And once I understood that, I started going back to bed at 10 o'clock again. <laughs> uh, ah, so you've got a, you've got a gift from, from the... A gift from the, of the, oh, the uh, It's all there. All we need, all the wisdom is inside us. Absolutely, no question of that. Um, and so one accepts that... I think every decade you have to make changes anyway. Adjust. And um, what did you learn about fidelity from being with Howell for so long? I think the fidelity is about a true love, is accepting the other person, warts and all. Uh, well, that's the clumsy way of putting it. Um, well, for instance, example in the book, oh no, the book on loving I'm writing, Malcolm Muggeridge, who I knew very well, he once said, he acknowledged to me, he said, I've been a great womanizer all my life. But Kitty stood by him, and when I knew them in old age, once out walking, they walk hand in hand, after supper they'd be sitting clasped hands across there, they became very close. And Jung was the same, 
uh, his marriage was central to his life, but obviously Tony, what's her name? Wolf. Wolf was important as, as Emma came to recognise that Tony was able to help Jung in a way that she couldn't. Um, so you learn to accept uh, the I mean, it's a wonderful remark that Tony Wolf, as an analyst, gave to a woman came to see her about her husband having an affair with another woman. And Tony Wolf said, Why don't you invite the woman to lunch or get to know her? And you may discover that she's able to give something to her husband that you can't. It's very wise, that. Very wise. Uh, so true fidelity is accepting the person in their entirety, oh. not as one would, would, uh, would like them to be or think of them as. Shut up, James. No, no, don't shut up. Well, nearly. But, but I, 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 I don't want to exhaust you. Um, this has been such a rich... Uh, but very challenging, very good questions too, yes. Well, I never have any trouble, um, you know... Asking questions? Talk, no, talking to you. I because see. You're yeah. so open and, and well, wise. Also, yeah, we're kindred spirits in that sense. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a link which one doesn't have with everybody. No, right. that's true. Yes. So, what do you feel about dying, about death? I have no fears. You've of done aging. <laughs> I've done aging. I have no fears of dying. In fact, um, if you can, you, I, I, I'll read you the, the final words of older. If you could just switch it off for a moment. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to hear that. Uh, I'd just like to quote from the final page of my new book, Older, which is coming out in September. This is what I wrote. One morning recently I woke with a deep sense of my ship coming into harbour at long last. And it reminded me of a painting by Margaret Neve entitled Homecoming. It depicts a night sky with a huge full moon reflected uh, in the ocean. And at the centre of the reflection is a sailing ship coming into harbour. And on the quay with their backs to us are five people in long robes waiting uh, for the arrival. And I want, looking at the painting, I sometimes wonder, is it Ulysses finally returning home after a long journey? Uh, and will it be likewise for each of us when we die, that there'll be those waiting uh, to greet us? And this is why I think of Kafaf, his poem Ithaca, about one long voyage to Ithaca that each of us has to make for which we have been aiming, but when we arrive, we find there's nothing more to give us. And so I'd like to quote, Ithaca has given you the beautiful voyage. Without her, you would never have taken the journey. But she has nothing more to give you. And if you find her poor, she has not defrauded you. With the great wisdom you have gained, with so much experience, you must surely by now have understood what Ithaca means. None of this implies that I'm about to die, but the readiness is all. I've had such a full life, blessed with so much love. And so, no wonder St. Teresa of Avila wrote, the important thing is not to think too much, but to love much. <laughs> I can get some food. Great. Great. Thank you. What a wonderful ending. <laughs> Oh, James, I really, I feel so blessed that you've... Well, it's, it's been a, a, a very creative experience. And thank you for it. Well, thank um, you. Food, food, food. Um, do you mind if I film you just pottering around a bit? You do whatever you need to do, yes.